Hello, David, and welcome back to a new session. Thanks for having me. I think last time we left it, we played with um, exploring um, an API uh, by basically programming a little bit the ob some objects and building views and building a browser for the API. And um, we left it, um, we said that we should, we should uh, follow up with uh, perhaps after you've had some time to, uh, to think a little bit about the, what we've done, what we've played with and maybe the implications. So here we are. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a couple of weeks and have definitely been thinking about this quite a bit when uh, uh, life hasn't been happening over the holidays. Uh, and uh, we actually, uh, you know, we had a, a conversation, a follow-up conversation about, uh, you know, looking through the GraphQL example uh, in the G Toolkit book. And, uh, you know, we talked about the idea of having me send uh, a, a view that I thought was interesting uh, that I, I found and actually did that last night. Uh, and uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I saw those. Yeah, so they were... <laughs> Uh, they were not my own views. I did not build those. Uh, those were part of what was already built into G Toolkit. Um, but uh, we talked about it from the you know perspective of showing a view that shows something uh, interesting without uh, talking about context and using that as a way to compress communication. Um, and uh, you know the the views uh, were views of the GraphQL API I was navigating through it using the, the G Toolkit inspectors. Uh, and the way that I was doing it was by going through and, uh, you know, clicking into uh, some of the results that I was getting and then seeing what came up next. Um, and what I actually found very interesting about that view um, is uh, that it actually talks, you know, in, in, in some way it talks about GraphQL as being an actual graph. Um, you can go from left to right and, you know, it, it, it's in the name, right? <laughs> Uh, but when you work with most GraphQL tools, tools, you don't actually see the fact that, you know, this this is a, a graph and it is a bidirectional graph. Uh, and so uh, the views that I sent were, you know, if me clicking into the organization uh, on the GitHub API and then, you know, having it pop up with all of the repos. And then one of the things that when we click into the repo, it shows you a link to the organization. Um, and if you click that, then it goes back to the view you had before. Um, which is very, very straightforward, uh, but the fact that it does it pane by pane, uh, you know, left, right, you know, you start on the left with the, with the initial query, you then have that second query, and then you can go, you know, see things pop back up where you go back to the organization. Um, that actually gives you a sense of the hierarchy. Uh, it also makes it very clear that that graph is bidirectional. Uh, you know, it's a, it is a directed graph, but there, there are cycles in that graph, uh, which is actually a thing that you can mess up with GraphQL pretty easily. So let me let me actually share that that uh, those uh, <clears throat> those pictures. So here's one. Okay, so the first one is this one where we have this is the result of a GraphQL, and we get the report back, and then <clears throat> because the the type of this one is organization. Uh, it actually offers a custom view, which is called repositories that lists all the repositories and open issues and closed issues and total issues. And if you select a repository, then for example, you can see the fields of it, or uh, you can also browse the open issues. So and this is a custom view. And um, the other one that I thought it was interesting that you mentioned, uh, the other the other view, um, is uh, this one, in which you selected the organization and the owner here, and uh, and then you end up with the same organization uh, object, and of course you have the custom view for it. Mm -hmm. So one thing that, by the way, like these views here, right? They they don't require a small talk class. So 
So there's no class. We could just create this class within the context of um, mm -hmm. just uh, specific to the type of GraphQL, uh, yeah. the type of the GraphQL result. So, <clears throat> and so you like well, this one. I, I did like that one, uh, mostly because uh, I feel like this is something a lot of GraphQL tools don't do not do well, which is representing the fact that this is a, effectively an object graph. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, here it's it's very straightforward. It's very clear that it is. And yes, you do have custom views uh, for each of these these elements. Um, you know, the uh, digging into this a little bit more, I was also very interested to see how the pagination uh, worked for GraphQL. Um, so I did a little bit of digging uh, digging on that. Uh, it is actually really interesting um, because you do have the, like you should said, we, you have the ability to create these. Should we go through the through the live, through the live um, uh, example? We can. Yeah, let's, uh, then we can take a look maybe in more details about it. Sure, let me go ahead and pull up G Toolkit. And here I have, let me close this. Let's go back to the book. And then let me come in here. These GraphQL, where is it? Um, it's in the case studies uh, at the top. Yeah, it's there. there it is. Thank you. And so you okay. should be able to. Yeah, you should. First of all, you have to set the key. I think you probably yep. have done that. And then you have to download the schema, which takes a little bit of mm -hmm. time. <clears throat> so we, we built GraphQL um, because it's, uh, first of all, we had an interest in it, but the second one, second reason is uh, that uh, it's a language. Um, so people don't see Glamour Toolkit so well at the moment, so much as uh, the, they don't see so it's not so obvious that there is a language workbench underneath Glamour's toolkit and that you can use these um, abilities to create the editing function as well, not only the reading um, mm -hmm. abilities through it. So this one here, right, you can have completion inside that editor. So you can have pretty much everything that you have um, in the typical GraphQL editors that you see on the web um, with uh, a couple of extra additional things. For example, errors, you will see them in line here rather than mm -hmm. uh, as a as a JSON result, like you have them in everybody else's um, editors. Um, but then, yeah, as you were saying, the more interesting part uh, is how we combine this with the, um, uh, how we combine this one with the other, with the rest of programming, like more imperative programming, such as pagination. So mm -hmm. let's go through it. And let me, so here we have a, the, the first GraphQL result. Uh, but let me go ahead and pull up the pagination example. Uh, yeah, so this and... one, right, we have here five, because it says here we yes. have a count of, we have a count of, um, uh, of five items that we expect here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, the other thing is that, with pagination, you, there's this pattern of using an after that we also see here. And uh, and then the other part is that this after basically goes hand in hand with this little extra page information. And then um, this thing at the bottom here is a little, we can see that this, this result is fed here in this variable that is available afterwards to be uh, played with, in this case, using um, just plain Faro. And then we have repositories query, and then there's a paginator utility, essentially, a little extension. And then we have these three things here. Did you Could you figure out what they do? So to me, well, this, you get the repository query that you attach a paginator to it. And I think what it does is that it uh, basically walks the edges for these nodes. Uh, so you are telling it to essentially get all of the uh, repositories for an organization um, and turn it into. 
Almost, right? Sorry. So it's here we have the first level, then we have uh -huh. the second level. And then yeah. afterwards, from here, we want these edges. Uh -huh. So here we have the path up to that point, and then we yep. have to tell it what do we take from that point on. So mm -hmm. that's basically what this path and this one is. And then mm -hmm. after is the name of the cursor, the name of the variable holding the cursor. Yes. OK, so let's see what happens if we execute that. So we still see the JSON string. Obviously, that's just the first one. And then there's mm -hmm. these items view. Right and the items view actually executes and does the pagination. So this is a, what we get here when you do this paginator, we get a stream. And then the stream just reads from the, yeah, streams from the stream and then puts, there's this default view, just puts the result here. Right, so <clears throat> so that's that one. Now let's take a look at the next one because we had, we had some fun with that. So the next one is exactly the same query, except that it does not have the page info here. Like the previous query had the page info with the with the boilerplate code, right? The, mm -hmm. If you go a little bit up, yep. it's right. right we there. see this page info and then has previous page, next page, start course, and so. And this is the pattern basically. So we can assume that. Others have it. So if we don't have, if we don't specify a page info, then we probably want to ideally we can assume that it's there. So let's see if this works. Okay, so we have this is the first one, we have the first string, the first five, and then we mm -hmm. have the same paginator. See if this works. Sorry, which uh query do you want me to run? Yeah, this one. This one. Yeah. So we still have now the items here. Let's see if this works or not. And it works. So it's interesting that this one works, but there is no page, page info. So yeah. why does it work? So I think my understanding of this is that it's because it's built into uh, this view. And yeah, probably. Nah, well, yes, maybe, but but how come, I mean, before I had to have it in the query and the here, I don't have to have it in the query. So where does so the this is one information? Of, so this is one of the things that I, I couldn't figure out how it was implemented. Yeah. Uh, my uh, assumption uh, in this case was that you were essentially extending the type uh, with the view. Let's see. And so, so there's an, isn't it interesting how we have an extra view that just appeared that is that is very true uh and so and yes that is you are extending the query with the page info which was previously explicitly and, and declared the, here yes and that's it so but what you can see here is that now we had a problem about some algorithm decision that wasn't quite clear Right, mm -hmm. and then the question is, how do we document that? How do we tell it to others um, what actually happens there? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, now here we our way of doing it is we're going to always try to put create some view there. Now, why did we do that? Right, we, it's because it was interesting to have it in this conversation, and it became kind of discoverable. So, first of all, views are there. Every any view is is guaranteed to work for some sort of questions. Um, mm -hmm. or is aim is, is designed to work for some to address some sort of question. Um, but and sometimes you you don't exactly know what uh, a view is for. So when it's it's always very interesting to just go through all the views um, that are specific to an object just to see what kind of questions did other people ask about this object, even if mm -hmm. maybe those are not your question. Um, often they reveal they reveal uh, interesting things about the about the, you know the, the thing that you're seeing. But here we actually wanted to debug this problem. This is not primarily a tool that we use to show people necessarily, 
um, it, it was a tool that we used to debug ourselves what happens in uh, in in different situations uh, when when the page info is not not being sent. So and then of course, yeah, we used it for debugging, and then now it's also useful for communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, this makes it very clear what changes uh, as part yeah. of this. So yeah, that and was so, uh, that was a fun project. Well, and sort of on the uh, on the back of this, I think the thing that I'm uh, so here where we're making this change, where does that actually happen? Uh, does that happen in the view? Is that something that happens, uh, you know, as an extension method uh, for a paginator stream? How does that work? Well, we probably don't know, but maybe I don't know one option. So we don't we cannot an answer that question from here. Um, okay. But uh, maybe alt clicking on future query could give us some results, some some hint. Okay, let me give that a try. I, I, mean, I we don't know what that the thing does, right? That um, um, so here we can see that the first one is a forward. So this is not where the interesting thing here happens. Mm -hmm. So this one forwards to the query, mm -hmm. right? So obviously the query has some sort of an ability. And we don't have to go there. We can just stay here. So yeah, let's see. I just uh, clicked the icon. Yeah. So it looks like um, we have the a from and the two, so the left and the right. Yep. And then and it, it looks, looks like... like we have a previous query, and then we have the actual operation, and this is basically what uh, what gets what happens there. So okay. this is just this a getter, operation. which means that. Yeah, which means that there's nothing that happens there in mm -hmm. this case. And let's see if the previous query, but I expect, uh, expect the previous query, yeah, this one. Okay, here. So is also just to get it, which means that by the time it gets to the to the query, it's already, we already have it with, mm -hmm. with, with the injection. So let's go up now. Okay. Here and see if we can see anything that gives us a hint. So basically says what is the object to which we're forwarding. So this is the object that will create the query. Yep. Right. And then we can see, okay, if the if if the result is nil, then we just put empty query. This is probably the next query, case. Yep. And it's oh look at this. We can have something like ensure page info type in query. So where there is it, it is. happening? Well, it's in the stream. Yeah. And then from here, I can see that we can have something like, uh, oh, look at this. That we have some sort of a page info inserter. Yep. And given some schema and some query and connection, blah, 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 it inserts. So we just answered the question. Yeah, indeed we did. So, so again, like there's, that's, that's the hidden interesting idea behind views. And having the views be reasonably concise, or the the specification of the view be reasonably concise, the views don't have to be complicated. In fact, we find that the it's much more interesting to have many uh, less complicated views than having a few large, compli uh, more complicated views. And the reason yeah. is it's much it's much in more interesting to to go from whatever you see to whatever the specification is, which then gives you some um it gives you uh, insight into the model behind it exactly the question that you had right yeah you had the question i well, have no idea where this indecision is being made and now we know now we know and i think this is one of the things that uh you know we talked a little bit about how one of the the big uh innovations i guess in glamour's toolkit is the ability to code in context uh and when I look at something like this, uh, you know, the the context for in which this is being used is very, very clear. I can see, you know, for this insert, uh, I can see exactly where that's being used, how it's being accessed. Uh, and then I can open that and see that thing, you know, in there and drill down through the levels without doing, uh, you know, we, uh, without doing all of the, you know, navigation and scrolling that we normally have to do. It's It's all right there. Um, and I think it takes a little bit of a of a mind shift. Uh, we've talked a little bit about how uh, scrolling is is a terrible way of uh, 
navigating through code. Uh, but it takes, uh, we're so used to it. It takes a, a bit of a shift to understand that that's not how this works. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So one of the, yeah, so this is, the, this is one of the contexts, right? The other kind of context is that we just basically picked up exactly one method to start from just by quickly going and connecting. Like if I look at this pane that you have on the left and and the one that you had before it, um, mm -hmm. right? It was, I just, I saw something here and then I could immediately jump to the, to the, to the specification of it, so to the coding part of it. And there are always yeah. this, the mixing of, Meta lay the of of meta levels is um th th that's something that we basically found to be mm, lacking in other we wanted an experience where we could just very easily and quickly mix meta levels without um without having to think of it in advance so if you think yeah. about it um in in typical editors where you have an index of things on the left and whatever you have on the right, and maybe you have a console. So you can have maybe one or two of these uh, meta levels at the time, but they are never connected. And you cannot jump from an arbitrary, very specific case to some meta level afterwards. It's You yeah. have to manually piece things together in your head. And uh, well, I'm, while I'm this... here, we just we can do this. I'm sorry, please, please continue. I just want to say that here it, we just wanted an interface where uh, where we can express quickly. Just go oh from, and then we can answer these kinds of questions. So from the way something looks, I say oh I have the intuition of what the view shows me, but I don't really have the understanding. And if I really want to know how to do it myself, or if I want to go and understand what the semantics of this view really are, so that I can. Uh, you know, know what to do with the information that I can get out of it, then immediately I need to go a meta level up and look at the specification of how is this view being produced. And then from there, we can quickly go uh, into, you know, deep, deeper and deeper. And so being able to quickly put those kinds of questions together uh, and answers to such questions like this together, we, we had this... Um, so the, this idea of context is, is very fluid. It's not, it's never, there's no global context. Everything is really well encapsulated. So everything, every interaction happens always within a context and context can be concatenated basically. So this then allows us to handle a very large variation of different scenarios without uh, without much effort basically. Yeah, and I think I, I want to call a little bit of attention to the the sort of workflow that we went through here, uh, because I actually thought that was pretty interesting as well. Uh, you know, we started over here, and you know, we see this query, uh, which is it looks like it's missing a piece, right? We're missing the page info, and somehow this thing still works. Uh, and so the question then becomes, you know, if if you're interested in knowing why, the question then becomes, well, why does that work? And there is this feature query that shows me that the object is being modified uh, or that the query is being modified, I should say. Um, but I don't really know how that query is being modified. Um, and so when we dig into this and look at, you know, the implementation of this view, uh, we can sort of, we, we see what the, the components of this view are effectively, the paginator stream and the modified query. And we can very easily go in and find the thing that is modifying the query. And so now I can go ahead and see that there is this thing called the page info inserter uh, that takes the query uh, and returns a modified query. Uh, and so that uh, it's a very different way of asking that question uh, because normally the way that I would ask that question is by you know, digging through layers on top of layers of code uh, without the clarity of this context, I may not even be able to figure out what is happening with that code, uh, you know, until I try to execute it. Whereas here, it's very obvious uh, from the beginning what's going out. And then normally the process would be to debug the query uh, and then sort of walk the chain of all of the things that, talk that, that touch that query until I am able to find the thing that modifies it. 
um, here, the view leads me to what I need to know. Mm -hmm. And here's the other thing, because, you know, when we, when we say, oh, we have an inspector that can have multiple views, it doesn't sound so, I mean, it's, yeah, it's probably interesting, but it misses the, a little bit, um, th this, um, uh, a, a little bit of a, a flavor here. So the mm -hmm. the point a tip if, if I think about the utility of a of a stream like this, then this items view here is is a like it's pretty much a direct uh it's, it's a direct mapping. It shows me this is the utility uh of this stream. Right? I, I have the I have a functional um you know perspective onto that stream. It's kind of it's the same as when I have I don't know a graphical object and then it shows me the drawing of the object, right? Of the drawing of the graphical object. It's a very like it's immediately I can see yeah I can see that utility, um, so I can see the validity or the reason for that view to exist. It's very easy for me to imagine. It. Mm -hmm. But what is less clear is that these views, they can handle all sorts of other perspectives that are maybe less obvious. And so, so here we have a view that documents a the question, a, another question of how it does something. Not, it's not a utility, it's not, not the immediate utility of it, but it's really like more of a documentation of the algorithm of some decision that this little thing does in order to fulfill its um, its intended function. Mm -hmm. So in the fact here that the question is, you know, where would where do you put this documentation? This is one or one one question uh, to ask because you also want it to be findable uh, reasonably easy. Uh, so you know we 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 find it that we always try to put these kinds of different alternative meta views if you want. Um, we put them also in the same object. And so sometimes we end up with multiple of these types of, um, um, you know, multiple kinds of object, uh, multi multiple kinds of views that people say, yeah, but, you know, maybe I'm not interested in the, all of those. Maybe you're not, right? So this is why it is important to understand what is the, what is the, what is the intended use of a view uh, so that you can consume its output. But the other one is that because we can um, because we can show because we can put any kind of views there, and so we can also document all sorts of additional aspects that are not so necessarily visibly and uh, visible from a functional perspective. right? And this is that's one. It's kind of an important thing, but it's it's sometimes we find it that it's hard. It not it it doesn't always come across, um, because one of the things that we started from was that simply just looking at a system from a functional perspective, from what it does, and whether or not it does it well, um, it, we found it that this is not enough because you often end up in situations where the system does what it's supposed to do but it's still hard to make it do something else that you might want it to do. And the 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 reason it's hard to, to move it to a new state is not because of what it does, but, it, but because of how it does it. So the structures and the decisions that the system make in order to achieve its functionality. And so having a way, an easy way, like, because this is nothing, right? Building these kinds of views is just... It doesn't take a lot a long time, and having a default way to attach these views, and so that afterwards you can formulate, um, you can formulate a, a narrative with these views, right? That is, that was a big challenge. So in fact, the largest, if we look back for the last when did we start? We started from about thirteen years ago. The 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 vast majority of time we spent it figuring out what can we extract out of inspectors, which is the inspectors are very simple in the end. It's just, we have some views, you can concatenate them, put them next to each other. Uh, you can execute code, they can have these meta views and that's pretty much it. 
and then there's not a lot there's it, they don't do i mean they don't have like a ton of features if you want and yet there's still many things you can express with it right so here we started we said oh let, what does this query do i can i read about graphql so i can understand what that graphql does right because I, I can see this i can you know i can go to the github uh graphql web page and i can do exactly what i hear in the first pane if you go to yeah. the first pane right so if i if i look at uh a little bit above right the query that i have here on top like this one here uh these are it's something that I, it's it's immediately obvious what what that thing does because I, I'm used to it. Like it's of one level. Then mm -hmm. combining this one with this next imperative code, well, there is less obvious. <laughs> that 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 there's a little bit of a, an unknown, right? But then this view over here concatenating with this view, it just it told me, oh, what does it do? Oh, it does that. Okay, I can see what it does. But then we had the next level of thing, right? So the first level was already not entirely obvious because the, you know yeah. all these graph people say, oh, look, we have this GraphQL is typed. We can have uh, um, these nice editors and there are nice editors that do completion and everything. Uh, but then what do you do with the result? <laughs> so now I have my query. What afterwards, right? Where is the, where is the experience? of uh, of dealing with the little tiny next step. Um, so that is not always there, right? So we have now the second one was here, right? We can see the utility of it. And then we say, but wait, why did it do this unexpected thing? And then we did another step there. So we looked there. And then from there, we went back to another level of meta and looked at the code of it. Yeah. So we jumped here two or three easily, very easily meta levels of, of uh, in our inquiry so that we can get enough of um uh we, we can we can get enough of a certainty so that we can go and interpret what happens here on the first one and that's basically this is the, the type of of inquiry that we think is is fundamental to 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 software because software is just it, there are so many different perspectives and they correlate and they have to all work somehow together which means and you it's so important that you any inquiry of a software system has to be able to navigate arbitrary levels of meta um, and just taking the information from various different sorts until I'm satisfied enough and then I can move on um, maybe to the next thing. So I just wanted to point that one out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, those are all absolutely valid things. And I mean, the thing is that applications don't, software doesn't follow the same structure. Uh, you know, every application is different. Every application is layered differently and makes different decisions about where the boundaries between those layers are. Um, and so a tool that, you know, part of the reason why we, we have, I think, tended to use text editors is because they are very flexible in terms of being able to sort of allow you to, to walk layers. Uh, there's no, because they have so little context, because they have so little uh, information about the layering and about how things are structured, uh, you know, you have to build that mental map, uh, but the text editor is kind of where things have been for a while. Uh, this changes uh, things quite a bit because instead of having to build that mental map uh, that we all do when we are you know, writing software, uh, you can explicitly declare that map uh, in your environment, uh, which is a very different way of working. And it's also interesting because uh, the ways in which we build those mental models, I think are different for every person. Uh, we all do it differently. We all think about it differently and we reason about it differently. Um, in this way, uh, you know, this uh, allows you to express something uh, very interesting. One of the uh, interesting problems in communication is uh, that there are mental models that can't be expressed. Uh, for instance, when I think about the color red, uh, I know what that looks like to me, but I, you know, and, you know, we can look at something and agree that it's red, but I don't actually know whether that thing is, you know, what I see as red is what you see as red. Um, this is very interesting because it allows you to express that internal mental model. This is how I think about and reason through this code. 
uh, in a very explicit way and make it part of the environment and show it to someone else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And th that's it. Also, like, so this is at the at the you know like at the at the environment level. But it's also interesting how we're using it. The reason I ask you to you know send pictures over and was it's over just a chat right with just one sentence next to them was. Uh -huh. Basically to say, well, can I understand what you mean by that picture um, without you actually having to spend, um, you know, a page of, of text uh, of description to, to send it yeah. to me, right? And in fact, I consumed, in your specific case, I was on the way and I, can, I just got your message and I saw those two pictures on my phone. And I think it took, maybe it took 30 seconds to to get what was interesting from your perspective mm -hmm. without actually having the explanation yeah and that's basically what we're saying about the the you know the the the, the ability to of this of this of this way of working of of compressing meaning compressing communication of course it does need a little bit of training it's like a language uh, mm -hmm. so one has to learn the language before one can use the language. But once you use the language, then you can be much more effective, like the much less energy. You have to spend much less energy afterwards to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to communicate in that language. And the same thing happens here. Um, so, um, but it's also the, the practice. The practice matters a great deal uh, because the question is how do these views get to be? So somebody has to decide to create the view and um, so we find that, for example, in the case of the future query, at first, we couldn't build that view. And it was also happening, it was not quite, we weren't so confident that it does what it's supposed to do, or that mm -hmm. it does it in all cases in which it's supposed to do. So we stopped and said, well, what do we need to do? So that we can actually show this. Oh, we need the before and after, which means that it needs to be an explicit step, which means that uh, so that we can show that diff. Not only this, mm -hmm. but we need the stream to also remember both of them, so that it can uh, so it can know what what it what it does here. So this should be it needed to be an explicit step that I could just call, and I can see the difference, and so that I can I can depict it here. And this ability didn't exist before. So from a functional perspective, it worked but it was not comfortable enough. So that's when we stopped and we wanted we, we went and built the code so that we can build the view. And there's this extra, it's an orthogonal force that pushes the design of the system. So just so that the design is, uh, you know, like you can build views about that design because you have the information. So it gives you the enough information to can build the view. So it, the interesting oh, yeah, yeah. thing here is when you use the view as the incentive for the design, not only the test, for example, as an incentive to to drive the design. Yeah, um, and I think it goes back to that conversation about making systems explainable. Uh, when you have something, and I think we've all done this at some point, you know, if you have some messy code and it's hard to walk through and, you know, you go, okay, it works, I'm just going to leave it alone. Uh, that uh, that code, if you try to go back and try to explain it, it's going to be very difficult to explain. Um, but when you are focused on it from the perspective of, I need to make sure that I can put together a view that explains this, uh, that's going to inform your design. Uh, just in the same way that, you know, I, I find that I write uh, tighter, less complex in terms of cyclomatic complexity uh, code when I'm doing test-driven development, uh, because the uh, the need for, you know, I don't want to write another use, uh, I don't want to write another complicated test uh, to be able to uh, test a branch that I can merge into another one, uh, you know, or that I can use to structure, you know, or where I can structure my code a little bit differently so that that extra test isn't necessary. Uh, it's the same thing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but it's a different, and it's just like that one is a feedback loop. This is a different feedback loop. And yeah. so when we saw that, which is not obvious from the beginning, but when we realized this, it got really exciting uh, for us. Mm -hmm. it, did, it didn't happen that long ago. It was about six years ago. 
uh, only. So uh, yeah, so let's go one step further. So let's execute this little query over here. Okay. So the the organization, right? So here we have something which is a GTGQL report. So it's just generic GQ the GraphQL report that we get back, mm -hmm. and we have a type of 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 kind of a, of a organization. And what we wanted was to say, well, what if we can package like basically like plug in. Um, package some custom views because these are it's well it's not so bad but that's still a mm -hmm. raw view of of what this means right so let's execute now this piece of code in which we tell the context the context is the same that we have here so this is the context in which the graphql uh, query will be um, executed and now let's execute this okay. this uh, this uh, query again okay and so and this is the moment when we get to see the repositories view, right? Mm -hmm. So we have now a, a, a GitHub specific GraphQL. And the GitHub specific GraphQL now knows how to interpret this organization and to give me a repositories view, mm -hmm. right? And so now it's, um, now I have that view, right? And then in fact, we knew that we want the repository. That's the reason why we wanted to build the, the paginator so that we can have this nice uh, demo, right? So let's go into one of the one of the repositories, maybe the toolkit, because that's a larger one. Yeah. And if we go in there, right, we have the open issues here. Yes. Right. And so those are and now these the, the type is the same, right? But then the differentiator is this type over here. The the, the small talk type is the same. But the real differentiator for the which views are active or not um, is the repositories view, the repositories okay. type, which is a GraphQL type. So essentially, now we have the infrastructure to for people to build uh, GraphQL specific views in the same environment that we use for everything else. Yeah. Well, and so, if I can explore for just a moment, uh, so if I come in and let's do that. Uh, you know, here is we're looking at the at this view. I think. Hold on. There we go. That's yeah, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so here we have you know that custom view. We see the repository issues for, uh, and we see the open issues. We see all of the information, and this is very similar to what we saw with the uh, with the JSON API uh, in the previous yeah. example that we worked through the yes. last time. Yeah. And so, and I imagine that uh, the same things that we did for, you know, the uh, previous example also had some very rich uh, things, including the ability to see the uh, the contributors and see their photos and all of those things. Yeah, uh, exactly. I imagine so, the very same thing could be done here. Absolutely. So we just did it for open issues just for, for the fun of it, but um, this is more of a demo in our case. But yes, uh, if mm -hmm. one would have a, an interest in in you know documenting GraphQL, now of course people go today and they write these little one-liners for every kind of query and then leave it to people. And some of them have examples, which is great. Uh, but here you could have actually the whole views, um, mm -hmm. and these views actually they can document the next, the next they can give you inputs because when you clicked on the repository there was another query that happened. Yeah. And, uh, and and then based on that, right? So you look at one context and it gives you some inputs to other kinds of queries that you can write starting from that context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then, oh, but also here, right? We have this um, GraphQL report. Again, this is a utility, right? So based on this little object uh, mm -hmm. that I have here, this is a utility type of view, so first level type of thing. Uh, but then I also have the fields and I have the type. And if I look at those, for example, at fields, right, then I will get the fields of this object, right? And then if I look at type, I'm looking at the structure of the object. So I look at the repository type and then I can, so now if I click on anything from here, I don't know, for example, interaction ability. 
Yeah, it's interesting because I can now go and, I, and I'm now navigating. I just switched the meta levels immediately, right? I went to something that I could yeah. touch. And then I'm now learning about what else can I do? Um, and and oh, yeah, so switching and... the meta levels, but now in a different language, right? The language yeah. here is not is not small talk anymore. Uh, we're, we're looking into GraphQL. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability just as, as we did before to dig into any one of these objects and see what composes them, what they're made out of uh, and see their description. Uh, what's going on with them. Yeah. Okay. And then there's one last step in that tutorial, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to this kind of... Uh... Um, so let's execute this one here. It takes... Ah, this one here. Okay. It takes oh, a bit of sorry. time. Okay. This Let is a normal, just the same thing. So we're now executing this one. This takes a little bit of time. It takes maybe a minute or so. Um, okay. what, what it does is basically says, well, let's given the, the schema, build all the possible paths for every type. So that means what queries can I take to end up with results of this type? Right. So this is basically what this one does. Maybe it's at the moment we have it as a, just one, one shot step, um, I'm sure we can optimize this one, but it was good enough for us to to go through. Uh, so we need to go through a, a larger uh, GraphQL with about two thousand um, types and lots of uh, lots of query options, and we needed to understand a little bit. You know, what are the possibilities? Um, what are the possibilities of um, of querying and getting into so how do I go from one place to another place for example or how how what what way do I what kind of queries do I need to can I think about to to get to to a certain point so we built this one is just just like a a tool right so now we have again we have this um the same context we have it back but now it has some types now so let's execute let's try to execute this query again now the same one with the organization and login and URL. Okay, so, right, so now we can go to type, right? And then let's go to the organization now, like we did before, just double click mm -hmm. on the organization. Okay, and now the organization not only has this, but it has also, for example, query path. Oh, that's so cool. These are all the paths, right, that can go to, um, that, that can end up with an organization. That can end here, yeah. Right, and it can end there. Also, and the same thing for mutation path, it should work. It should tell you uh, how, where can I set organizations, for example, it can be kind of interesting, yeah. right? And then of course the same uh, in, in the other way is uh, this one, um, these are the places, like as you were mentioning, that these are like a, you know, it is like a bidirectional. So now I have a type. I can know the fields, so I can know how to navigate one way. And here I have the references to this type. So what other fields have this as a type? Right. So this gives me the the opposite. So we have a number of these kinds of tools now, so that we can go and discover. Now, yeah. the thing here is we built this whole infrastructure for GraphQL just because we had the need to go and understand one GraphQL schema. So we looked at what exists there, and then we saw we it's not it's unreasonable. It's it's too slow to if I have a two thousand, you know, a, a, a schema of two thousand types and hundreds of queries. It's just it's very it, it just takes a long long time, right? To to go and find all the options, all the possibilities. So for us, it was much faster <laughs> to to build a whole in a whole environment going. So we didn't have anything. I think within one month we built this whole thing, including the editing part, mm -hmm. right? So one about one person month of of effort, and then we could go and build a build the actual, you know, the actual utility of the 
uh, of, of working with a specific GraphQL uh, using the tools that we've built. Yeah. Well, and I, I think the thing that I think about when I see this is, you know, this is this is a lot of information. Uh, and even with the views, uh, I have a lot of, you know, there are still a lot of things here to navigate. And I can see, you know, in the case of this organization, all the ways in which I can get there, I can see uh, all of the type references. Uh, this is all of the information that I would need to be able to take this very complicated uh, GraphQL uh, implementation and visualize it. Uh, and see it as, you know, nodes that I can walk. Uh, and if I were trying to understand what the central concepts are behind this API, uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to guess, uh, I would then be able to do the same kind of adjacency diagram uh, that, you know, I, I've done a few times with, uh, with Java code uh, and see what are, the, what are the anchor elements, if you will, for this API? What are the things that are most important that I'm most often going to have to interact with? Uh, and then focus on learning those. Uh, and then the other things I can look up, but most of the time, the things that are most adjacent or that have most adjacencies are the things that I'm going to have to interact with the most often. Yeah. And then, of course, like those that are necessary, those that are, you know, around somewhere, right? They are not necessarily the, the, the nicest or the most interesting ones. So for example, mm -hmm. if you go to query path, let's see if we can, we have luck. And you can scroll, just scroll all the way to the bottom or towards the bottom. Oh yeah, here. Okay. Right? So we have these kinds of things. Those mm -hmm. are the deprecated queries, right? So just because something exists and maybe you can find it quickly, you know, just an example. And this is not necessarily the most, uh, might not be necessarily be the most interesting uh, path to take. Mm -hmm. So, oh, by the way, yeah, because you would say, what do you mean that it is, right? That's another good point. So what do I mean when I say it's it's deprecated, right? In this so case, the, I... the thing that I wanted to look at is this one. That's the immediate thing. But what is deprecated? Mm -hmm. This is deprecated. It's somewhere along the way that there is a deprecation. So the, those are difficult, difficult to to communicate, right? But again, like, how do we? Why did we build this one? Well, because we wanted to find out what is the meaning of deprecation. And so, yeah. given a path like this, then of course, then you would have to look at it. So, to 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 debug <laughs> whether or not this is yeah. deprecated or so. Uh, yeah, it just goes on like that. Uh, yeah, basically. and then you know, it also. In, in a way, this almost gives you, uh, so it takes something that is normally very flat to us. Um, when we are looking at an API, uh, we are looking at what the, this is what the API looks like now. Um, and, you know, these things might still be there. They might still be documented. They may even still work. Uh, but uh, what this tells us is, you know, to some extent, how this API has evolved over time. Uh, what are the things that they have pulled out of it that they've decided are no longer viable ways of accessing this? Um, and so it almost gives you a kind of timeline and two dimensions of, you know, this is what the API looks like now, and this is perhaps what it looked like in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I wanted to do one more exercise with you, uh, and it's still about this GraphQL. So let's go to the uh, first uh, in the first the second pane, so the result okay. of the first query. Yeah, so we have these repositories over here. So let's go to the repositories like you did before. Mm -hmm. Right, and now you say Glamour Toolkit. Yeah, you maybe you have to scroll a little bit horizontal. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. So G Toolkit. Right. And now you, you, I think you went to fields, mm -hmm. and then you you pressed on owner. Yeah. All right, and then we have this, and so you wanted to communicate that this is a graph, right? And then I can navigate it this way, and then I can also go back, for example. Mm -hmm. And the so, and you use two pictures for that, which is already yeah, it's nice, right? But let's make one picture out of it. Because you know, 
two pictures two pictures is one picture is better than one uh, than than two if if it communicates the same thing we yes. don't know if it, if we can so so basically grab from here and drag this way basically to resize the pane yeah okay. that pane doesn't have to be full screen Screen. And, okay and yeah. so then we could actually just the resize same, also a couple the of same. these yeah yep. just the, you just need three of them yeah and it should be enough and then we can do and same then here. just from there until you see the third one yep. popping up right so now if you take Oops, this as I... a uh, yeah if you take that one here. yeah you made a mistake it doesn't matter you can click on that and see repositories again or something but basically yeah if you maybe enlarge this a little bit more and if you if you use this as a as a screenshot right it first of all communicates much better that there is your intent the, the the context of this one is in the context of this one that they are mm -hmm. linked right i don't have to piece this information in my head if i yes so so the, the point that i wanted to make here is that so we we built the we use we use these kinds of pictures to communicate. I just uh, counted yesterday, and we have more than four thousand pictures being sent over the last twelve months, on, on over our chat. And these are pictures exactly like the kinds of pictures that you've sent, pictures about the inside of the system, and mm -hmm. that that communicate whatever some some sort of an aspect. So these are a primary mean of communication for us. Um, we, so we are, you know, basically less than 10 active developers um, sending 4,000 pictures over the course of uh, 12 months. So uh, that would probably make it about, uh, you know, one one to two pictures per day per developer or per mm -hmm. individual. And uh, so so these are really like they, they, we use these pictures to summarize what we think. And of course, the environment makes it because we do this, then we also made the environment more or so that you can create these kinds of pictures. But it also still it requires a bit of exercise to think about what do I want to show here? And very often, you know, this is a, a, a simple thing that where I can take two pictures and then maybe concatenate them. But sometimes it's not just enough to just, you know, resize things into and have multiple panes. Sometimes I say, oh, maybe I need, I, I clicked two, three. Maybe I, ha I have two, 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 one, two more steps than necessary. And I, I, I go and I take a, a view that is somewhere to the right and I bring it more to the left. Mm -hmm. And so the, the incentive for this is just so that I can make the picture fast, uh, uh, simpler so that people can mm -hmm. gather my, but it's really interesting how that same, um, how that same incentive is also, also leads to people finding, oh, look, I have this information here exactly when I look at the problem. Yeah. So it's, you know, what we call demo driven uh, development. This idea is that if I cannot show what I mean, I probably have to stop and rethink a little bit. Uh, what am I showing? Or is the system, you know, does the system allow itself or allow, does the system allow me to show it in a way that I think it should be shown or not? And if it doesn't yeah. allow me to show it, then I have to go and affect the, uh, the system or the environment um, to do it. So I just wanted to point out this little exercise. And I think the other thing that is is interesting, you know, I I used this uh, kind of view to communicate something, uh, you know, but we we also saw another way of communicating the same thing because uh, if we had wanted to, we could have achieved, uh, we could have seen this query path uh, in that view that we we saw earlier. It would have been in there somewhere, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, it's it's interesting because it leads you to. Uh, have multiple different ways of expressing the same thing. And sometimes, you know, that that other view, uh, knowing what it is and what it does, if you have that background, uh, explains very clearly uh, what, 
what you're trying to display here, the, the bidirectionality and composition of the graph that, that forms the GraphQL API. Uh, the, you know, but if, if you're not looking at it from that way, just being able to use something like this, this very basic connection of inspectors with handy little arrows that shows this goes into this, which goes into that, uh, just gives you, you know, a very high level view. And, you know, it, it's interesting and encouraging to me in some respect, because one of the things that I have thought about a lot as I've been looking through this and, and trying to understand how to think about problems in this way is, you know, the practice that it takes. Um, and what this tells me is that you don't, you know, yes, it helps to have practice. Uh, and, you know, something we, you and I have talked about a lot or had some conversations about is the, the importance of deliberate practice. Um, but it uh, tells me that you don't have to have extensive practice to be able to display something interesting, which is actually, you know, a big deal and very encouraging. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. But well, some people find it still that it's still a little bit too difficult, but um, it's good to hear that it's not that difficult. No, I mean, it, it requires you to think about it differently. Um, and that's, to me, that's really the, the hard part. And I think, you know, I have the benefit of being able to have these conversations with you and sort of learn from how you think about it. Uh, which helps sort of shape my own thinking. Um, it's a different mental model. And that's really what's hard about this. The, the actual code that we saw in the thing there, it seems like it's particularly complicated. You know, if you are familiar with the environment and you're familiar with small talk, I don't think anything in there would have taken you more than 15 minutes to code. Uh, you know, if you knew what you were doing. Uh, I think the, the thing that is difficult is shifting your thinking out of uh, having that model in your head uh, where you are keeping track of all of these objects and uh, compressing them down and putting them into something like this where it is explicit. Uh, that is the that is the, the hard part about this. That is the hard part by far. So basically, we, we, we sometimes jokingly or maybe a little bit more seriously, I'm not sure. But basically I'm saying, well, every time, every time one picks the scroll bar to to basically do you know just use the eye uh so just to scroll through text and to in order to find something you're basically using the eye as a data mining tool so mm -hmm. in in my view like maybe one option we know would be like to have a little you know electric shock like every time you're picking the scroll bar and just uh, you catch it <laughs> every time the environment catches you to that you, you're using your eyes to to go and find things so that like, should um should remind you that now maybe <laughs> go and formulate an explicit question and uh, see if you can build a tool for it <laughs> because indeed this is the hardest part it isn't the building the technology is not hard uh, learning because it's like just technology um what is more difficult for people that already have background in programming is to stop doing the programming in their head like in what they're used to, and yeah. and and formulating the question explicitly and after formulating the question explicitly thinking about what would be an interesting view here and we can see here for example if you like i mean just see what we have in front of us these viewers, there's nothing particularly exciting about them, right? There's just some column views. We have one, three, three of these column views um, uh -huh. in this uh, in this view. So it's this not, you know, we don't need to have super fancy visualizations, which super fancy visualizations are very interesting, um, and you can do those with with GT as well. But you don't have to uh, to extract more value than the than the present baseline, which is very low. Um, but um, so that's a good news, right? Is that there is some hope because it things don't have to be fancy um, to to have significant value. And what I found really interesting in in the message that you sent is that you could derive um, worthiness, right? You, it, you found that this concatenation of views is remarkable. And the re they are remarkable not because they appeal to my eyes, 
necessarily in in how fancy they are right i'm just using some black text on white thing but the the, the little meaning that is associated with them that's what becomes that, that's what makes them remarkable right or that that's what you found is, uh, to be remarkable and that to me is the essence of it there is some sort of there is a there is a way of 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 um appreciating beauty inside the system that is not necessarily related to how fancy it looks although that has its role i will not deny that mm -hmm. so um and and yeah so that's that's what i i enjoyed very much uh, when you when you send that that picture now for the is the next step right we would we get try to to when we coach people to to learn multiple development and they start to actually start using it actively for some purpose let's say building a model of this and that we ask them document your document your um journey of building that model building the app building the analysis building whatever that is of building the system with these views so for example we are documenting uh, our journey of building lamaris toolkit by social media or or, or blogs or so um, with just little tiny, very tiny snippets, maybe a picture, maybe a little movie, but very, very short with very little uh, mm -hmm. or close to no explanation. And the reason for that, people wonder, why do you do that? And uh, it's actually very interesting to look back. So look at the history of how things evolve and you can pinpoint or like here I learned that or here I learned the other one. Um, mm -hmm. And then having people sometimes re- um having people you know for example you tweet a picture like this one and then you have other people retweeting that picture and this blows my mind because you know like retweeting is a marketing activity right and yeah it's so interesting how you can just take some fact out of you know, some weird i don't know something uh, some weird technical you know thing obscure somewhere in the core of things that nobody will ever see and you make it to be, you 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 reach so you touch someone so much that they find it interesting enough to make it equal to other you know maybe shallower marketing messages out there and then treat them in the with the in the same way right so that act of retweeting uh, for example so um, and I find this to be very very exciting and very very encouraging in fact that's the that's the reason we are doing it is that is it possible to 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 take some weird details that maybe only a handful of people actually care about uh, make them interesting for other people that have would have never cared about them um, because yeah. if we can it means that it is possible this idea of taking um uh, the idea of taking um, um, of, of taking a, um, a system and making it explainable to other people, ideally even non-technical people, um, is actually attainable. So, okay. And on that note, um, I think it's a good you. note to end on. Yes. Let's end on. Let's end here. This is very. It's a very high note. So, <laughs> so Peter, um, thank you so much for taking the time again. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for your continuous enthusiasm, and uh, yeah, let's continue these conversations. That'd be great. I look forward to it. Okay. Well, thank you.